Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to the Serial Killer series. And this time around, we're talking about Andrew Cunanan, murderer of Gianni Versace and four others. When we last left off in part one, we were talking about how Andrew had just met Jeff Trail. Jeff Trail would be a person that Andrew would consider his best friend for many, many years. Jeff Trail would also be Andrew Cunanan's first murder victim. Jeff was a graduate of Annapolis, a very good pilot and an excellent marksman. He came from a good, tight-knit family. He was honest, open, warm, and friendly, and he always kept his word. Even though Jeff would eventually come to accept he was a gay man, he was a straight-laced Republican who didn't smoke or drink and didn't approve of others doing so. Being in the military made it hard for him to accept his sexuality when he saw every day openly gay soldiers were being harassed and removed from the military. He was posted in San Diego on the USS Gridley, which is where he met Andrew. And Andrew, who had always had a thing and an attraction to military men, developed a secret crush on his new friend. Jeff was still coming into his own as an openly gay man, and Andrew, who was the belle of the ball, basically Andrew was accepted and welcome at all the hot spots in the gay community of San Diego. He took Jeff Trail under his wing, he introduced him to people, he helped him feel more comfortable and helped him navigate this new world that Jeff was trying to become a part of. Jeff Trail was handsome, hardworking, and kind. And basically, he was a catch. And it was clear to everybody besides Jeff that Andrew was infatuated with him. But Jeff had no interest in Andrew in that way. He liked grabbing dinner and drinks, hanging out with friends, being friends. But Andrew would also get on his nerves sometimes. The two would argue from time to time, but they'd always make up and end up being okay. Many people warned Jeff that Andrew wasn't the well-off gentleman he tried to project that he was selling drugs, that he was into some questionable activities. But Jeff didn't believe it. He said that Andrew had family money and he was so believable and so convincing. And in a way, Jeff felt kind of bad for Andrew. He pitied Andrew who tried so hard to make people like him when Jeff, all he had to do was be himself and people by default liked him. He was a likable guy. He thought deep down inside Andrew was a good guy, the kind of friend who would bring you soup when you were sick. And he felt bad for the guy who he knew tried too hard. Andrew's drug activities turned more serious when he began dabbling in crystal meth. In Hillcrest, the real parties happened after hours when the alcohol went away and the crystal meth came out and Andrew was taking as much as he was selling. Crystal meth is a strong, very addictive drug, and San Diego was the crystal meth capital of California. Andrew had realized he could turn a pretty big profit buying the drug in California and selling it in the Midwest where it wasn't as available. But nothing good ever comes from messing with crystal meth. It made him even louder, more manic, more obnoxious, and the crash that came after the high was debilitating. Crystal meth is a stimulant that will give its user a long-lasting euphoric feeling, but the after effects of the drug are the exact opposite. A person will feel exhausted, drained, physically just spent, depressed, anxious, because of the negative feelings a person experiences when they're coming down off of crystal meth, they have to use again in order to regain that positive feeling and that sense of euphoria. And this starts that vicious and toxic cycle of drug use and abuse. It also changes the brain's actual structure and function. Chronic users can face such issues as aggressive behavior, a sensation of power and invincibility, hallucinations and paranoia, irritability and restlessness. Many chronic users of the drug can't even fall asleep and they have to take powerful downers in order to even get some rest. 
And so begins that vicious cycle of taking drugs day in and day out, taking drugs to feel awake, taking drugs to feel asleep. And Andrew Cunanan was firmly in the grasp of this cycle. He was purchasing a large amount of crystal meth, spending $4,000 a month in order to maintain his habit. He couldn't sell as many drugs as he needed to keep himself supplied with as many drugs as he needed. So he started looking for an older man to take care of him, somebody to become essentially his sugar daddy. Andrew began networking with Lincoln Aston's friends, researching their hobbies and interests, but most importantly, researching what their net worth was. And these men loved Andrew because they felt like he was one of them. He could act like a snobby trust fund baby, but he could also talk at length about politics, current events, art, culture, architecture, all the things that they were interested in. These men were rich, powerful, influential, but they were also gay and they weren't always openly gay. Andrew told them he was the son of rich parents who, when they discovered his sexuality, had kicked him out. And they related to him on this and felt bad for him. Eventually, he found just the man for the job, 58-year-old, soft-spoken, filthy, rich Norman Blatchford. Norman had started and successfully run a sound insulation equipment business and he sold it in Phoenix, and that's where he made all his money from. His main home was in Phoenix, but he also owned a really nice condo in La Jolla, right around the corner from Andrew's old alma mater, Bishop School. And Norman was prime for the taking. His long-term partner of 26 years had just passed away from AIDS, and he was lonely, looking for companionship, and was flattered that he'd caught the eye of a bright and handsome young man such as Andrew. In May of 1995, Andrew's old friend, mentor, and financial provider, Lincoln Astor, picked up a 36-year-old drifter from a bar named Kevin Bond. He brought this man home for the evening, and that night, in his own house, he was beaten to death with a stone obelisk. Kevin Bond confessed to the murder, but Andrew would tell everybody that he'd seen Lincoln the night he was murdered. And after everything came out, after Andrew's killing spree happened, a lot of people thought that he might have been responsible for Lincoln Astor's death. Even though the police have ruled him out, Kevin Bond is doing time for this crime and confessed to it. The way he was beaten to death and the fact that he knew Andrew, had affiliations with Andrew, people to this day still think that he might have been responsible for that murder. In July of 1995, a year after they met, Andrew moved into Norman's La Jolla condo and he became a kept man. Norman bought him a brand new $33,000 Infinity. He paid his credit cards for him and he also gave him a monthly allowance of $2,500 to spend as he pleased. Norman really saw a lot of potential in Andrew and he wanted him to go back to school to get his education or learn a trade. He thought he had a lot of potential that he wasn't reaching and he offered to pay for whatever path Andrew wanted to take. But Andrew was a lazy narcissist, the two worst things to put together. He'd never had to work for anything in his life and he didn't really think that he should have to. It had always been fairly easy for Andrew to figure out a way to fund his lavish lifestyle without having to do a lick of actual work, so why would he start now? But just as his drug-abusing status was something that Andrew wanted to keep secret, he also wanted to keep the fact that he was kept by a sugar daddy secret as well. These two things didn't fit in with the character that he put out there to everybody. Someone who came from money, somebody who could pay their own way and pay everybody else's way as well. He didn't want people to know that an older man was basically his source of income. 
Andrew would make a big show of inviting everyone out for dinner, paying the bill, and then lavishly tipping the waiter. He would leave a tip on the credit card, he would put some additional money on the table for the waiter, and then when he was sure everyone was looking, he would press more money into the waiter's hand on his way out. So he wanted everyone to think that he just had this endless amount of money to spend that he came from money, that he was somebody who was better than everybody else. And Norman, for the most part, who traveled back and forth from Phoenix to California regularly, let Andrew do whatever he wanted. Andrew traveled the country on Norman's dime, staying only at the best hotels, making reservations at only the best restaurants. In November of 1995, Andrew flew to San Francisco, where he stayed at the $520 a night Mandarin Oriental. He started to reconnect with some of his old friends from the Castro district, because remember when he lived with Liz and Philip, that's where he hung out. He wanted to meet up with all these people that he used to have to cling on to to get drinks and dinner and show them now how much money he had and how important he was and he wanted to be the one to treat, but not out of the kindness of his own heart, just specifically to show that he could. He was treating everyone to dinner one night at an expensive restaurant when he noticed a handsome blonde sitting at the bar of the restaurant by himself and he proceeded to send over a drink to this man. This man was David Madsen, the man who would be called the love of my life by Andrew and would also die at his hands. David was just Andrew's type. Preppy, handsome, gorgeous blue eyes and an incredibly charismatic personality. He was an up-and-coming architect from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he was in San Francisco on business, and David was understandably impressed with Andrew De Silva. Andrew had money, he dressed as if he just had stepped off the pages of Maxim, and David was very into fashion, having two closets of clothes at home in his own loft. He was surrounded by friends and admirers who were basically just using him for his money, but to David it appeared that these were friends and admirers, and he showered David with compliments and attention and made him feel really good. With David, just like Jeff, Andrew fell hard. I think he saw in these men everything that he was not. David and Jeff had both come from parents who taught them to work hard to achieve their dreams. They both had motivation and drive that had led them to be successful in their chosen career paths. They were liked by others. They were kind with a good moral compass. No colorful character that Andrew Cunanan could create would ever come close to the genuine and three-dimensional character that these two men actually were. That evening, David accompanied Andrew back to his fancy hotel and stayed the night, and the two struck up a relationship. Andrew bought his crush expensive gifts, which at first David refused to accept because they were so expensive, but Andrew would get sulky and angry and you know offended if David didn't accept the gifts. So eventually David did just start taking them and he came to really enjoy the gifts that Andrew would give him. And in the very beginning, the two got along pretty well. The only problem was David lived in Minnesota and Andrew was in California. David would often want to come visit Andrew, but Andrew always had an excuse of why he couldn't come. He was traveling the world, checking on all his financial holdings. He was never at home. He couldn't give David an address or a phone number to reach him. It was pretty much only when Andrew was available that David was able to talk to him. And obviously the real reason for this was that Andrew didn't want David to find out about Norman. And he didn't really want Norman to find out about David either because as flexible and accommodating as Norman was, Norman wasn't paying Andrew to fly around the country and pick up other men. David got the impression that Andrew was afraid of commitment. He just didn't want to commit. He didn't want to settle down. He was flighty. He couldn't be counted on. And David just didn't like that. He got the impression Andrew wasn't being honest with him. He didn't know what Andrew wasn't being honest about, but he just knew that he was hiding something. And David didn't really like that. David was an upfront, simple, 
stable kind of guy who just wanted honesty and reciprocity in a relationship. And he also kind of liked having the control and the power in a relationship. He liked being the one who was pursued. He was an architect. He was handsome. He was a catch. And he always felt like he had to keep chasing after Andrew, always trying to find out where he was or if he could hang out. And he didn't really like having that feeling that he was chasing someone when he thought he was the one that should have been being pursued. And even though Andrew was living a life of luxury in Norman Blatchford's condo overlooking the Pacific Ocean, that wasn't enough for him. He began to whine to friends that he really hated living on the beach and he'd much prefer to live on Mount Soledad. Mount Soledad was the highest hill overlooking the bay in La Jolla with amazing views and even better homes. A few weeks after Andrew was saying this to his friends, Andrew and Norman moved into the house that had been previously occupied by Lincoln Aston on Mount Soledad, the very place he had been murdered. For a man with a lot of money, Norman was cheap, or at least Andrew thought he was. A lot of Norman's older friends noticed that Andrew seemed to be spending way more than his $2,500 allotted allowance for the month. And they began to bring it up to Norman, like where else is he getting his money? Is he getting it from another man? What's going on? But Norman at first was pretty much blind to Andrew's fault. And most of the people who knew the couple together said they seemed to have a genuine connection and care for each other. Norman threw Andrew two parties, one for their mutual friends, their like high society friends, and then one for people Andrew's own age, his friends from Hillcrest. Andrew invited Jeff Trail to this second party, but still concerned with image and how Norman and his associates might view Andrew based on the people he hung out with. He gave Jeff a pre-wrapped pair of Ferragamo shoes and told Jeff to give them to him at the party. He also gave Jeff another pair of Ferragamo shoes and told him to wear those to the party. And since he was going to be wearing expensive shoes, he'd have to have a profession to match so that if anybody asked what Jeff did for a living to tell them he was a doctor. Jeff Trail, who was known for his strict moral code, was uncomfortable with this whole charade, basically lying for Andrew, but he figured Andrew was embarrassed of his, you know, military background or his middle class lifestyle, so he went along with it. Andrew would make trips back and forth from San Diego to San Francisco to see and spend time with David. He told Norman that his ex-wife and his daughter lived there, so he had to keep going back to see his daughter. When he went to Minneapolis to visit David, he told Norman that his sister lived there and she was an anesthesiologist. In May of 1996, when David and Andrew met in San Francisco, an old friend of Andrew's pulled David aside and told him, basically, you've got to watch out for Andrew. Nothing that kid says is the truth. He lies about everything. David had already begun to sense that there was something off about Andrew, his unavailability, his secretive ways but he was still so impressed by his money, the way he flashed it, the way he spent it, like there was no tomorrow. At first, he ignored his better instincts. That summer, Norman took Andrew on a tour of Europe with him and some friends, and Andrew would write to David a postcard from every city he went to, telling him how much he missed him, telling him that he couldn't wait to see him in July. They were planning on seeing the fireworks together on the 4th of July. Eventually, these postcards started to become a little bit more secretive. He said that there was dark forces trying to keep the two apart. He didn't know when he'd be back in the States. He might not make it home for the 4th of July. And this really agitated David since he'd already had a conversation with Andrew about being more present, about being more available. And here Andrew was basically throwing away plans that the two had been very excited about. And while in Europe, Andrew and Norman had a lover's quarrel about Norman not buying Andrew a car. Andrew wanted a brand new Mercedes SL600 convertible to the tune of $125,895. But Norman said no, 
and Andrew kept pressing him. He felt he deserved that car, even writing a postcard to David saying, I might be getting my new Mercedes soon. But the final answer from Norman was still no, and Andrew threw a fit, telling him if he didn't get the car, he was leaving Europe. And Norman said, well, you're not getting the car. So Andrew made a big show of packing his bags, and he left a note saying, I've moved on. But he also left a number where Norman could reach him in case he wanted to reach out and make accommodations that would satisfy Andrew. Andrew was banking on the fact that Norman felt it wasn't worth losing Andrew over a car. But Norman was very smart with his money. It annoyed Andrew to no end that when they flew somewhere, Norman made them fly coach. Not even business class, Andrew said. It drove him crazy because he knew that Norman could more than afford to fly first class everywhere and that buying that $125,000 car would have been like nothing to him. Andrew returned to San Diego and he moved into an apartment, a studio apartment in Hillside, and he waited for his phone to ring for Norman to call him and say, hey, I'm sitting outside with your Mercedes. Can we get back together? That call never came. Norman finished out his vacation in Europe and when he returned to the States, Andrew reached out again, trying to regain control over his partner and their relationship. Even though he had no real leverage in the relationship, Norman was the one who was older, who had the money, who had the notoriety and the societal ties. And Andrew didn't have the leverage that he thought he had over this man, but he really wanted to believe he did and he wanted to get control of Norman again. Control was a big part of Andrew's personality. He hated to be told no, and he hated the thought that somebody else might have a final say in what happened in his life. How could he really have developed any other way though, right? Being raised to never be told no, to be handed everything without ever having to work for it or even deserve it or do anything for it. That's the kind of kid that he was raised to be. That's the kind of adult that he was raised to be. Andrew gave Norman a list of demands that Norman would have to meet in order for their relationship or their arrangement to continue. He wanted a raise in allowance. He wanted the Mercedes. He can't let go of that Mercedes. He wants the Mercedes. And he also wanted to be written into Norman's will. Norman was willing to raise his allowance and that was it. And Andrew didn't think that was good enough. For a man like Norman, I'm sure there was no limit of handsome young men who would love to move into his hilltop mansion and drive a car that he gave them, even if it wasn't the car that they wanted. Andrew had no leverage, but he was too much of a narcissist to admit this, and he didn't think Norman was going to call his bluff. And when Norman did call his bluff, Andrew was left high and dry, having pushed David away by not being available, by being too secretive, and having pushed Norman away by wanting too much and being too entitled. Norman wasn't bothered. He gave Andrew $15,000 and went back to Europe with a group of friends that he had actually met through Andrew. And he went on living his life just fine, just fine without him. Now that Norman was out of the picture, Andrew reached back out to David, you know, the man who was always on the side waiting, but David wasn't really on the side waiting any longer. He'd grown tired of not being able to reach Andrew when he wanted, of only being able to talk to Andrew when it was okay for Andrew. With both Norman and David becoming tired of Andrew's antics and kind of drifting away from him, Andrew turned his attention back to Jeff Trail. He told Jeff he was coming to stay with him in San Francisco for a couple of days, but it turned into a couple of weeks and he wore out his welcome very quickly. While he was there, he cut his hair in the same style as Jeff had his hair cut, military style, very short and close cropped. And he actually started hanging out with Jeff's boyfriend. One day he brought him out to lunch, got him drunk, and then brought him back to his car where he sat there and showed him pictures of David and cried about how he was the one that got away. Finally, when they got back to Jeff's that evening, Jeff's boyfriend being out all day with Andrew and coming home drunk, Jeff was obviously not too happy about this. 
and he kind of at that point was done with Andrew. He was becoming more and more uncomfortable with Andrew's act, especially when Jeff's boyfriend, Daniel O'Toole, told Jeff all the stories that Andrew had told him and Jeff was in a, a tough position. This was his boyfriend and everything Andrew had told him was a lie. Does he protect his friend Andrew or does he lie to his boyfriend? And he basically told Daniel, listen, nothing that kid says is the truth. Jeff became more and more agitated that every time they were out with large groups of people, Andrew would lie and bring Jeff into the story. Andrew told everybody, that he had known Jeff since kindergarten, which wasn't true. They'd only known each other a couple of years. And Andrew would tell people, if you want to know anything about me, ask Jeff. So he was basically depending on Jeff to corroborate all these outlandish tales. And Jeff was so straight laced, so honest, you know, so the typical military man, like living by a very strict code of ethics. And it made him so uncomfortable. And Andrew was consistently trying to get him to lie with him and for him. Andrew's life of putting on a thousand different masks had put him mentally in a position where he could not participate in an actual real relationship. He didn't even know who he really was. After years of pretending to be so many other people, and once others tried to get close to him, it wasn't long before they realized that they never would. It's possible that Andrew sensed Jeff pulling away too. It's possible that because he was so good at picking up on nonverbal cues, he felt Jeff getting frustrated and agitated with him. And after losing his revenue source and the man that he actually believed that he loved, and now to have a guy that he thought was his best friend pull away from him, Andrew was most likely feeling aimless. He traveled back home to La Jolla for Labor Day weekend, and when some of his old friends from school saw him, they noticed a huge difference. Andrew was subdued. There was no flamboyant cries of hello or bear hugs, and he had gained weight. With the speedy metabolism of his teenage years behind him, his aversion to exercise, and his drug habits combined with his tendency to eat rich foods, the physical deterioration could not be denied. An old friend of Andrew's, a woman named Stacy, said he was not shy about expressing his disgust at letting himself go, saying, just look at me, I'm awful, I'm horrible. At the end of October, Jeff Trail moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota to work for a propane company that hired ex-military. This gave Andrew the perfect opportunity to try to reinsert himself into David Madsen's life. Jeff was moving to the same city that David lived in, and Andrew could visit Jeff under the guise of trying to help his friends settle into the city. He could reach out to David and say, hey, my friend's moving there. Can you get him comfortable with the city and get him acquainted and make sure he meets people? At this point though, David had already moved on and in a relationship with a man named Robbie Davis from Washington, DC. David's sister told him, just don't answer Andrew's calls. Just don't respond to him. He'll go away eventually. And David really didn't want Andrew around. He would roll his eyes every time he was brought up in conversation. But at the same time, David Madsen was a caretaker. He was somebody who wanted to help other people and who felt sympathy for other people very deeply. And he felt sympathy for Andrew, just like Jeff did. But neither Jeff nor David could summon up the courage to tell Andrew this to his face. They had a misdirected sense of loyalty to a friend who had been so generous and kind to them in the past years. But at this point, Andrew Cunanan was in dire financial straits. He was in debt $40,000 on his credit cards. And he had to sell the infinity that Norman had given him just to pay the rent and keep up appearances. But it was pretty clear to everyone who knew him that something was going on, that he wasn't in a good place. He looked tired and worn all the time and he began to behave strangely. He would invite a bunch of people to dinner, but then he would wander off in the middle of dinner and go buy some magazines then come back and read them at the table while everybody chatted around him. 
One minute he was social, the next he was withdrawn and moody. In mid-November, he visited Minneapolis to attend an event which was happening at David's home, and he pretty much shocked everyone when he began acting out at the party. He filled a plate with party food and fed it to David's dog, Prince, who everybody knew was not supposed to get people food, and then the dog proceeded to throw up all over the place. And while everyone was handling that, he walked over to the table where the food was and the candles were, and he took a plate of napkins, lit it on fire, and then dropped it on the table and walked away. And everybody's looking at him like, is this kid for real right now? Like, we all see what he's doing. He's acting completely crazy. The last straw though was when Andrew began flirting with David and trying to rub off against him at the party and being physical and David's boyfriend Robbie Davis was there and he had had enough. He basically pushed Andrew up against a wall and was like, okay, I get it, you're who you are, but when you're here, you're gonna have respect for David, for me and for our relationship or you can get punched in the face, which I'm about to do. And Andrew was like, whatever guys, we're cool, no problem, I don't care. You didn't have to be as astute as Andrew was on picking up on nonverbal body language and facial expressions to know that everybody was fed up with Andrew at this point, but he was too far gone to even care. David and Jeff hoped that with so many people making their opinion on Andrew pretty well known, he would get the hint and leave, but he didn't. Where would he go? He thought Jeff and David were his closest friends in the world. And he figured, yeah, you know, I'm going through a hard time right now and they're a little agitated with me, but we're gonna be okay at the end of it. David and Robbie went skiing in Vail that weekend and Andrew stayed at David's house and watched Prince for him while they were gone. Andrew would keep flying back to California, but before long, he would be back in Minneapolis visiting with Jeff and David. And his friends in California noticed it wasn't just his body that he had let go. His whole appearance had become very sloppy. He traded in his tailored suits for jeans and a t-shirt. His once playful and expressive eyes were sunken in and surrounded by dark circles. And his drug use and rage kept on increasing. He would wrestle with friends pretending to be playful, but they would have to stop him and tell him he was hurting them. There were also reports that Andrew was becoming significantly more involved in the world of hardcore pornography, S&M, and bondage. He was so hyped up on ecstasy, crystal meth, and cocaine, he would have to inject himself with morphine or Demerol to even go to sleep. And he continued to make whatever income he could from slinging drugs, finding himself smack dab in the middle of a large drug ring in the area that was fronted by legitimate businesses who used their resources and equipment to move their stock. Friends were concerned, but that didn't stop anybody from using Andrew, like they always did use Andrew. And this included David. In February of 1997, David and Robbie broke up, and David immediately began seeing another man, a television producer. At this time, Andrew was telling friends that he was going to do whatever it took to win David back, and that he'd even bought him a ring and proposed to him, but David had turned him down. In March of 1997, David, Andrew, and David's friends, who were a couple, Karen and Evan, went on a trip to Los Angeles. Karen's father had just died and she and Evan were getting married, so she asked David to walk her down the aisle and Andrew generously offered to pay for their wedding reception and also gave Karen a $900 leather jacket for a gift. Karen and Evan were happy to be on the receiving end of Andrew's kindness, which basically was just a way to impress David. Look how well I'm treating your friends. Look how much I'm giving them. Don't you want to be with me? Andrew paid for David to fly first class to LA and paid for the two of them to stay at the very expensive Chateau Marmont in Los Angeles. He also brought along a trunk of sex toys that he expected he and David to use together. They spent the weekend with Andrew footing $1,400 bills for expensive dinners in Santa Monica, pricey sushi lunches, and a $1,200 Armani suit for David. 
On the Saturday of that weekend, Karen brought them to Lisa Kudrow's mother's house for dinner. So Lisa Kudrow, the actress from Friends, she and Karen had been friends from school. And so while they were in town, they went to her mother's house for dinner and Andrew spent the entire time trying to impress the actress, telling her that he was the producer of Titanic. Titanic, the movie. Andrew was trying to win David back with the only thing that he thought he had left, which was money, which he didn't even have because he put everything that weekend on credit cards, which he was already so far in debt with. And when he got David back to the hotel that night and must have opened up his trunk and was like, hey, David made him very well aware that he was not interested in a sexual relationship with Andrew any longer, that they were just friends. And this infuriated Andrew to be put in the friend zone after having spent thousands and thousands of dollars that weekend on David and his friends and their trip. And then to be told, I'm not going to have sex with you after all that. He was just livid. And while it's true that David did use Andrew, I think for his money, for the most part, everyone else did too. And David was looking for a genuine relationship with somebody. He was looking for a relationship where he could be honest with that person and that person could be honest with him. And he'd already made that clear to Andrew that he didn't think it was ever going to be a possibility with someone like Andrew who was so secretive about everything and could never be honest. And even though Andrew told David he was going to change, he wasn't really changing, was he? Andrew wanted wild, violent sex like he saw in his SNM pornography, and David wanted vanilla sex and, you know, love and companionship and friendship. They wanted two different things. And Andrew, as much as he thought he loved David, he didn't actually know how to love somebody. He didn't know how to be loved. And he didn't know how to give love because he'd never experienced it. He'd never had the opportunity to be truly and selflessly loved by somebody. And you have to be truly and selflessly loved by somebody, which is usually your parents. They set that model for how you show love. You have to have that in order to give it. And since he'd never had it, he couldn't give it. After that failed weekend, Andrew returned to San Francisco for a couple of weeks. He drove around a red rented Mustang. He visited with his sister, Gina, who lived there. They had drinks together, and he even took her daughter, his niece, to the movies. This was the last time that anybody in his family would see Andrew Cunanan. As soon as Norman had taken Andrew in, Andrew had basically dropped his mother. He'd left her, and he didn't give her a second thought, never really went back and considered if she was doing okay, didn't send her money, knowing that she was struggling financially. Back in San Diego, Andrew told everybody he was going to be moving to San Francisco full time, but first he had to go to Minnesota because he had unfinished business with Jeff Trail. He began giving away his expensive possessions, his shoes, his cashmere sweaters. Everyone was happy to take these things, but they didn't realize he was saying goodbye. He threw himself a farewell dinner in one of his favorite restaurants, but he made it very clear to his guests that for once, he wasn't going to be able to foot the bill for this dinner. He was out of money. His credit card companies had withdrawn his credit line. All his oldest friends attended and they toasted him with champagne. Andrew's favorite server plated up his absolute favorite dessert, a decadent chocolate tort. And on the plate, he wrote, goodbye to you in raspberry sauce. But it was a somber affair. Everyone sat around the table and reminisced how they'd met Andrew, how they knew Andrew. And in doing so, they realized that they all knew each other because of Andrew. Andrew, the eternal networker and social butterfly, the man who could bring out the extrovert in any introvert, they all agreed that in a time of their lives when they'd felt lost, Andrew had given them direction and made them feel not so alone. Many in that community saw Andrew as a fixture there, as just part of it, and they thought he'd be back. And he looked at them and he said, you don't know me at all. I won't be back. With his last money, he bought a one-way ticket to Minneapolis, Minnesota, 
and he left California behind him forever. When he arrived, Jeff and David were not enthusiastic to see him. Hi everybody, I know I'm wearing different clothes and I'm in a different spot, but Bella was waking up so much yesterday when I was recording the video that I eventually just had to stop because it was becoming too hard to keep going up and taking care of her when she was waking up and come back down and record because she was really sick. So I just stopped and I'm gonna have to take a part of what I'm recording today and integrate it into the video that I recorded yesterday to make part two. So that's why I'm dressed differently and also sitting in a different area. I had already recorded my coffee and crime time today. So I was already set up here and I didn't feel like moving. So that is why this is going on. We're not in a parallel universe. We didn't time travel. That's the explanation. So let's continue on. All David's friends were confused as to why David was even allowing Andrew to come back and visit. But David just kept repeating, you know, he's going through a hard time right now. He's trying to make a change and he's technically still my friend. He's a good guy inside and I just want to help. Jeff confided in his sister that Andrew coming to visit was making him anxious because a visit from Andrew always morphed into something more. And Jeff distinctively got the impression that Andrew wanted something more from him than he was able to give. The thing was, Andrew was always trying to make a relationship with Jeff more than a friendship. But Andrew just settled with a friendship with Jeff because it meant more to him to have that one person there that he thought would be there for him no matter what, rather than to be romantically involved with him. It didn't stop him from always pushing for more though. He hoped that if he was just around all the time, and in Jeff's face, eventually Jeff would come to see him as something other than a friend and the relationship would just take its natural course into a romantic relationship. Jeff's sister told him, you need to be upfront with Andrew. Tell him you're seeing someone and let him make the decision for himself whether he still wants to come and force himself into your life. And Jeff finally did have that hard talk with Andrew that had been a long time coming. He told Andrew he was in a relationship, that it was serious, and that they would never be anything more than just friends. And apparently, because of this conversation, Jeff and Andrew had a pretty big falling out. Jeff told everybody he wasn't going to be talking to Andrew anymore, and he made plans to be away the weekend that Andrew was scheduled to be visiting Minneapolis. That weekend, the weekend of April 25th, Jeff took his boyfriend, John, for a little overnight trip in the country to celebrate John's 22nd birthday. But he told Andrew that Andrew could stay in his apartment the Saturday night that they were out of town. It seemed like David knew what Andrew had come into town to discuss with Jeff though, because he told some friends that Jeff and Andrew had unfinished business to handle. And when his friends asked him what kind of business, he said, I just don't really wanna get into it now. Andrew arrived on Friday, April 25th with one black Toomey duffel bag. Inside the bag, he packed handcuffs, pornography, and five 200 milliliter bottles of ML testosterone. Andrew, as far as we know, didn't use testosterone, so it was speculated that he either brought it to sell to make some money while he was in Minneapolis or to give it to David as a present because David was very concerned with his appearance and he worked out a lot. But friends and family of David said he never touched the illegal substance and he was actually very against performance enhancing drugs and any drugs in general. That Friday night, Andrew and David met some friends of David's at a restaurant for dinner across the street from where David lived in the Harmony Lofts. And David's friends got a really bad vibe from Andrew. One of his work friends was teasing David about his clothes and Andrew looked at her and said, wow, you're really kind of a bitch, aren't you? The women who had dinner with David and Andrew that night said David didn't appear to be his normal happy-go-lucky self, that he seemed uncomfortable and tense. And Andrew kept urging David to show his friends the present that Andrew had bought him. It was a gold Cartier watch fastened to David's wrist. Altogether, they just didn't really like Andrew all that much. They found him very possessive and not really friendly. After dinner and drinks, David and Andrew went to the Gay 90s, a local dance club where they danced a little bit and hung out, but Andrew left before David. The next morning, which was Saturday, David woke up early to work out as he usually did, and he spoke with some friends on the phone making dinner plans for that evening. 
One of these friends heard Andrew in the back asking David, who are you talking to? And David curtly responded to Andrew before moving back into the conversation and dismissing him altogether. On Sunday, April 27th, one of David's neighbors reported loud yelpings and thumpings coming from David's loft, which started around three in the morning and continued until about seven in the morning. The neighbor says he wasn't sure what these sounds were. He just assumed that somebody in the apartment was having some fun. Later that Sunday morning, David canceled lunch plans with a friend and he and Andrew were seen walking into a local bookstore around 12.30 in the afternoon. When Jeff and his boyfriend John got back into town from their getaway, Jeff dropped John off at work and then told him he had some things to discuss with Andrew, which he didn't really want to do, but it wouldn't take long, just about 45 minutes. John, who was curious about what it was Andrew and Jeff had to discuss, he wanted to ask, but he didn't because he didn't want it to appear like he was prying into Jeff's private business. What is happening? After this, Jeff went to another one of his friend, Jerry Davis's softball game, and everyone there said Jeff seemed normal, you know, happy-go-lucky, friendly, in a good mood. Afterwards, he went home to bake a cake for John's birthday because they were having some friends over later that evening. At 5.30 that night, Andrew was seen by a resident of the Harmony Lofts getting off the elevator at David's floor. At 6 p.m., John went to Jeff's apartment and took a little nap, and at 8 p.m., Andrew called Jeff's apartment and left a message on his voicemail telling Jeff to give him a call when he could and leaving David's number. Jeff called Andrew back, but he didn't really want to meet with Andrew. He told his boyfriend he'd rather not. Why don't they just go to a movie instead for John's birthday, which John declined because it was his birthday and he wanted to go dancing and have fun. So Jeff grudgingly agreed to meet Andrew at a coffee shop around 9 p.m. and he told John that he would meet up with him afterwards around 10 or 10.30 at the gay 90s. Jeff Trail never showed up to meet his boyfriend at the dance club that night. Andrew never met Jeff at that coffee shop, indicated by a call from that location to David Madsen's loft around 9.08 p.m. What is speculated that happened is that Andrew took that call from Jeff and told him instead to come to David's house. Because at 9.45 p.m., an intercom call was made to David's loft from the downstairs intercom, and this was the kind of system where you couldn't buzz somebody in. So if somebody was downstairs and wanting to get in to the apartment building, you would have to go downstairs and let them in. So either David or Andrew went downstairs to let Jeff in, or it is also theorized that David may have been on his way out to walk his dog Prince, which he often did every night before the 10 p.m. news came on, and he just let Jeff in while he was on his way out to walk Prince. No one knows what actually happened when Jeff Trail entered that apartment, but we do know it happened very quickly. David had been renovating his loft and there was a claw hammer sitting on the dining room table. This hammer was used to beat Jeff to death as soon as he got there. There was a dent on the wall to the left of the door suggesting that one of the blows missed its target and a splatter of blood on the hallway wall outside of David's apartment door suggested that the blow that did hit its mark, the first blow that hit its mark, happened even before Jeff closed the door after coming into the apartment. Around the time that Jeff arrived at David's apartment, a neighbor heard somebody yell, get the F out, followed by thumping noises for about 45 seconds, followed by footsteps running down the hall, and then water running and then it was all quiet. The first blow from the hammer landed on Jeff's skull and there was defensive wounds found on his arms. Altogether, there were a total of 27 blows from both the claw and the blunt side of the hammer to Jeff Trail's face, head, and upper torso. The watch he was wearing stopped at 9.55 p.m. Brain matter was found lodged in the door. It was a brutal, ruthless attack, clearly fueled by unbridled rage. It is speculated that Jeff, who was having money troubles of his own at this point, had borrowed several thousand dollars from Andrew, and Andrew had come into town to collect. And when Jeff didn't even want to meet with him or see him and acted like he didn't want him there, 
Andrew just lost it. He had given this man so much in their years of friendship, spent so much money on him, lent him money whenever he needed it, and now he was acting as if he didn't even want him around, like he was a bother. Andrew, who already had no capacity for handling rejection in an adult way, and who had been exposing himself to violent pornography and mind-altering drugs, he probably didn't need much of a push to pick up that hammer and end the life of the man that he had called his best friend for so many years. All his pent-up rage and fury at being used and discarded by so many, all his feelings of inadequacy and self-loathing just exploding out of him as he completely lost control. Jeff's lifeless body fell on an oriental carpet that was on the floor in the entryway of David's home. His body was rolled up in that rug, dragged 10 feet, and leaned up against the sofa in the living room. His legs that were sticking out from the bottom of the rug were covered by a neatly folded cream or off-white blanket. So where was David Madsen when all this happened? Was he in the loft? Did he witness Jeff Trail being murdered? Did he walk in on the scene after it happened because it happened very quickly? Had he been in the bathroom? Or maybe he was downstairs walking his dog? We aren't sure, but we do know there was a lot of blood which had been attempted to be cleaned up. And there was two sets of bloody footprints on the hardwood floor in the dining room. One set of footprints was wearing shoes and one set was barefoot. So at some point, David was present and there. At that point, he became Andrew's captive and possibly was even forced to help Andrew hide David's body and clean up the mess. Why would David become a part of this or not try to escape. Maybe he had been there when Andrew had killed Jeff. Maybe he was terrified of what Andrew had done and was terrified of that rage being turned on him. Maybe Andrew had somehow managed to convince David that he was going to be held responsible for this crime or at the very least an accomplice since he'd been there and it was his house. Jeff's watch and his navy ring were removed from his body and placed in a plastic drawstring bag, along with a bloody Banana Republic t-shirt and the rags and towels that had been used to try and clean up the blood. This bag was placed under the dining room table. When Jeff failed to meet John at the dance club that night, John went to Jeff's apartment around 1.30 a.m. and when he found he wasn't there, he waited. When Jeff still hadn't returned by 8 a.m., John called the hospitals, the jails, Jeff's place of work, and no sign of him. He then called the police with Jeff's VIN number and license plate, only to find that they were very dismissive of his concern. He's a big boy, he can do whatever he wants, John was told by the police. And he was also told that unless his parents came forward and had an issue with where Jeff was or said they were concerned, John had to wait at least 72 hours to report Jeff missing. Now John knew that Jeff was not out to his family. And John didn't know how he would approach calling Jeff's parents and saying, hey, I'm your son's friend or I live with your son and you know I haven't seen him in a while. He just didn't know how he was going to approach that conversation. He felt very awkward about it, so he waited. He heard Andrew's message on the voicemail and he called David's loft twice, but there was no answer. On Monday morning, David didn't show up for a very important meeting at work, which was unlike him and his coworkers were concerned. When he didn't show up the next day, on Tuesday, they were very concerned. So they decided that a couple of them were going to go over to David's loft and see if he was okay. They went up to his loft and they knocked on the door and they said what they heard inside, they found kind of odd. They heard Prince in there scuffling around and scratching at the door and they also thought they heard people whispering inside. They called the police who arrived at the Harmony Lofts by about 2.30 p.m. Tuesday afternoon, but they never actually went up to David's apartment. They were concerned that if they knocked the door down and David was inside, they would be responsible for having to pay for whatever damage they did to the property. So they told David's friends, if you guys want to you know, sign this paper and agree that you'll be responsible for whatever damage we do, we'll go in there and knock the door right down. But if David's dog, Prince, gives us trouble, we're gonna have to shoot him. Now, David's friends knew how important his dog was to him, and they didn't want anything to happen to Prince, so they basically just went into the super's office, the super of the building, and left her a message saying, we haven't seen David in a couple of days. We're worried. Do you think you can use your master key and go in and check on him? The neighbors were also asked if they had seen David, and a couple of them had. 
On Monday afternoon, David's neighbor, Kathleen Peterson, had been riding the elevator down to the ground floor of the lofts, and when she got to the ground floor, the elevator opened up to reveal David and Andrew standing there waiting to get on the elevator. She and David had always been friendly with each other, so she said hi and tried to make conversation, but David wasn't friendly this time, and Andrew stood next to him saying absolutely nothing. On Tuesday, they were seen by a first floor resident walking prints by the river together. David seemed disheveled and looked as if he'd been crying, and Andrew was talking animatedly. Around 4 p.m. on Tuesday, David's super got the message from his friends saying they wanted her to check in on David, so she went up to David's loft with the master key and opened it and immediately saw Jeff Trail's body propped up against the sofa. It was very visible as soon as you entered the loft. Her initial thought was that David had been murdered, so she went back out into the hallway, taking prints with her, and called the police, and within 15 minutes, they were there. In the refrigerator, they found two plates of food partially eaten, and in David's bedroom, on the bedside table, they found two glasses of water, handcuffs, leg cuffs, a bottle of lubrication, and two rolls of masking tape. There was also used and discarded pieces of masking tape balled up on the bedside table and on the floor. Andrew's black duffel bag was also found with some new additions. An empty gun holster, an empty gun magazine, and a box of bullets with 10 of them missing. Now, in my opinion, the police, for the most part, completely bungled this investigation. Bungled. I don't know if anybody uses that word anymore, but that is what they did. After finding these things in the bedroom, they assumed it was a gay sex thing gone wrong. And the rug with Jeff's body in it wasn't even unrolled until 7.20 p.m. when the morgue came to pick it up. The entire time, they thought it was David's body rolled up in this rug. They misinterpreted the entire scene, and they didn't even realize there was a third party involved until much later. As they're sitting here, not looking for David because they think he's dead in the rug, David and Andrew are getting further and further away, driving down Highway 35 in David's red Jeep Grand Cherokee. Some of David's friends did tell the investigators about Andrew being with David that weekend, but they couldn't remember his last name. They were only able to physically identify him. This led the police to wonder if maybe Andrew was the one rolled up in the rug, since David had blonde hair, which they could clearly see from all the pictures of him in his own apartment. I don't know why it took them that long to realize that maybe it wasn't David in the rug. And the person in the rug, his hair could be seen sticking out from the top of the rug, and it was dark, and Andrew had been described as having dark hair. Once the body was removed to the morgue, they were able to positively identify it as Jeff Trail. His wallet and identification were in his pocket, and he also had a tattoo of Marvin the Martian on his ankle. Since the body was found in David's apartment and David was gone, the police said, well, David must have killed this guy in a gay sex thing gone wrong, and then he left and he took off. And then they started to worry that maybe they'd entered the apartment illegally since David wasn't the one who was dead. So then they left the apartment until they got a warrant, which they didn't until 9.20 the next morning when they returned to the apartment and continued their weak investigation. While all this is happening, Jeff's boyfriend, friends, and family are all still looking for him. Jeff's sister was in the hospital giving birth, and Jeff's parents thought it was odd that they couldn't get a hold of him because he knew that she was going to pop any day, and you know he was sitting by his phone waiting for some kind of news or information. Once one of Jeff's friends got in touch with Jeff's parents, and they confirmed that they too hadn't heard from him or seen him in days, the police finally did fill out a missing persons report, which they filled out with the incorrect license plate number. In that report, they gave Andrew's name, David's name, and David's phone number because the last message on Jeff's voicemail was from Andrew, who had given his name and had also given David's loft number. On Wednesday, April 30th, Minneapolis police called Jeff's parents and basically outed him to his parents. They said, you know he's a homosexual, right? His parents did not know. There's two police officers who are important to this case. Sergeant Robert Tichich and Sergeant Steve Wagner. 
Tichich thought that David was responsible for the murder, or at least an accessory, right from the get-go, and he wasn't really willing to look at any other possibilities. But Wagner, who had done some looking into David's background and spoken to his friends, thought that the David who had been described to him couldn't possibly have done this. He thought that they were going to find David dead, another victim of Andrew Cunanan. Local police in Jeff's hometown in Illinois informed his parents that he had been found dead. Jeff's parents, who were very close to their son, found out within days that their son had been hiding a big part of who he really was to them and that he was gone forever. They'd never be able to tell him it didn't matter. They didn't care. They loved him no matter what. John Hatchett, Jeff's boyfriend, called his parents that day as well. His parents were having a birthday party for him at their house that evening. And he called and spoke to his mother, completely devastated. He told her he was gay, and he told her that the man he'd been seeing had been murdered. She told him, come home. Let us take care of you. None of that other stuff matters. We'll handle it later. But right now, you need to be with us. Jerry Davis had recovered Andrew De Silva's name and contact information from David's Rolodex, but Tichich didn't seem too concerned with who Andrew was at all. He truly thought that David was the suspect here, and he put out an APB on David's red Jeep, but the APB didn't mention Andrew at all. There was also no mention that the suspect who was driving the vehicle should be detained. It was just like, be on the lookout for this kind of car, and then do nothing. Titchett had come up with this homosexual love triangle theory. When they found Andrew's duffel bag in David's room, Titchett thought it was David's. It was David's duffel bag. He didn't do any investigation into the duffel bag. He just assumed it was David's with the gun stuff in there and the steroids in there. And he developed this whole homosexual love triangle theory where David was with Andrew, but Jeff was coming in and trying to take Andrew. So David killed Jeff in a steroid fueled rage. And then he and Andrew escaped. If he'd bothered to do some actual police work, and look inside the duffel bag, he could have easily pulled out the luggage tag and seen that the name on the luggage tag in the duffel bag was not David's, but Andrew Cunanan's. It was more convenient for Titchett to be able to neatly wrap up the case as jealousy between three men, one of which was on steroids and flew into a rage. David's friends and family were outraged by this. David was a kind person, a caretaker. Furthermore, he and Jeff had been living in the same city for six months and nobody had been murdered. Yet the weekend that Andrew comes to town, Jeff Trail ends up dead and David's missing. When Titchett did end up speaking to David's parents, he told them that their son was a homosexual who had flown into a steroid-fueled rage and killed someone. Once again, outing David to his parents because David's parents had no idea that he was gay. At this point, the Madsons, surprisingly, didn't want to deal with Titchett anymore, preferring instead to speak to Steve Wagner, who was much more empathetic and open-minded about the situation. Titchett spoke with the author of Vulgar Favors and claims he has no idea how things went wrong with him and the Madsons and why they really didn't want to interact with him anymore. He says he didn't know what happened. He thought everything was going fine and suddenly, you know, they soured towards him and he doesn't know what happened. <laughs> On Saturday, May 3rd, two friends were scouting for potential camping sites by East Rush Lake in Chisago County, Minnesota. East Rush Lake was just about 60 miles away from David's home at the Harmony Lofts, under an hour drive. They found David's body laying on his back, dressed in jeans and a flannel shirt, about 12 feet away from the lake. He was shot three times, once in the right eye, once in the right cheek, and once between his shoulder blades in his back. It was as if he'd been surprised by his attacker, or maybe even possibly running away. His body had been dragged 20 feet from where he was shot and left by the lake. Here's another place where the police severely messed up this investigation when trying to determine David's time of death. They thought the body looked fresh, and when the forensic pathologist looked at David's body, she claimed that he hadn't been dead very long, not more than 36 hours, putting his time of death somewhere on a Friday afternoon or evening. This meant that David had been with Andrew for five days, giving Sergeant Titchett something to hang his hat on. This proved that David was some way involved. Even though he was dead now, even though he was a victim of Andrew, 
He had been involved because he'd been with the killer for five days and had made no attempt to escape or get help. This time of death was supported by a sighting of Andrew and David at a nearby cafe. The Full Moon Cafe was about eight miles away from East Rush Lake, and the owner, Jean Rosen, claimed she saw Andrew and David come into the restaurant on Friday, May 2nd for lunch. They had two California burgers and two bottles of Grain Belt beer, which is a historic brewery in Minnesota. Her friend, Michelle, who was also there that day, confirmed this sighting, and she said she specifically noticed the two coming in because she thought the blonde one was cute, and it was clear they were gay, and she thought it was a waste. David's friends and family once again vehemently disagreed with this sighting. They said that David had been found wearing completely different clothes than he had been described to be wearing at the cafe and that he would never drink Grain Belt beer. During his autopsy, there was no sign that there had been food that was previously eaten in his stomach. Despite all this, the forensic pathologist and the police took this sighting as confirmation of the forensic pathologist's time of death estimation. And they failed to do the two tests that would scientifically give a more accurate time of death. The vitreous humor, which is a gelatinous substance behind the eyeball, can be tested by running it through a software program, and that tells a very accurate time of death. Additionally, the blowfly larva that was found in David's mouth had not been tested, and if you look at the life cycle of the blowfly, and you test the age of the larva found in his mouth when he died, you would be able to more accurately represent what time he had died. But they didn't do these tests because they thought they already had it figured out. During Maureen Orth's investigation into this case, she actually spoke with both Jean and Michelle from the Full Moon Cafe sighting. When she talked to Michelle, Michelle said she remembered that day because she wrote Jean a check and she had been there to give it to her. And Maureen asked her, could she go home and look at her checkbook and just double check the date on the check to see if it had actually been the date that she'd seen David and Andrew. When Michelle got home, she called Maureen and sheepishly told her that the date on the check was April 27th, a full week before she claimed she'd seen David and Andrew at the Full Moon Cafe. Once this sighting was contested and David's parents asked the medical examiner to do the test, the vitreous humor test or the blowfly test that would actually determine his time of death, the case was closed and the police had no, they had no interest in reopening it and doing these tests. Even though David's parents offered to pay for the test, they still didn't want to do it and I think it had less to do about money, less to do about opening a case up and more to do with trying to hide how badly the whole thing was handled. The whole investigation was handled poorly. The time of death should have been more scientifically determined instead of just saying, well, the body looks fresh, so he must not have been dead too long. The problem with David's time of death really came from the discovery that David's red Jeep had been parked in a parking garage the Wednesday before his death from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. in Chicago. Chicago was where Andrew would go after killing David to kill his next victim, Lee Miglin. So how was the Jeep in Chicago on Wednesday, but then they were back in Minnesota on Friday for Andrew to kill David, and then Andrew went back to Chicago? In order for this police theory to have worked, Andrew and David would have had to have left Minneapolis, driven to Chicago, where they were on Wednesday, parked the car there all day, then came back to Minnesota in Chisago County, where Andrew then killed David and left his body there, and then drove back to Chicago to kill Lee Miglin. It just doesn't make any sense of why somebody would do that, especially considering that East Rush Lake was less than an hour drive from David's apartment, but Chicago was an almost a seven hour drive away from East Rush Lake. So why would they have done that at all? Doesn't make any sense. Why if Andrew had really wanted to kill David, why would he do all these crazy round trips? Why wouldn't he just kill him on the way? Or in Chicago, where he was already going to kill somebody else. It's more likely that David walked in on Andrew when he was killing Jeff, and Andrew made David help him, took him hostage, drove with him to East Rush Lake, where he then put a bullet into his back, realizing that David wasn't going to go along with whatever Andrew wanted. Maybe David tried to escape. That's why he was running away when Andrew shot him. Either way, I don't believe at all David was a party to Jeff's death. I don't believe at all that David knew Andrew was going to kill Jeff, was okay with Andrew killing Jeff, or that David was helping Andrew in any way, shape, or form. 
After their son's death, David's family placed a wooden cross at the spot he died by the lake. And on the cross it said, Blessed be those who are a blessing to others. They had also discovered that David had already purchased and wrapped Christmas gifts for his nieces and nephews. This was not the kind of person who hurt or killed people. This was the kind of person who purchased Christmas gifts for his nieces and nephews in April and already had them wrapped and ready. David may have been there when Jeff died, and he might have seen what Andrew was doing with the hammer and yelled to Jeff, get the F out of here. That may have been what his neighbors heard, trying to warn Jeff, trying to tell him to run, but Andrew was just too fast. And then David was terrified. That's going to be all for part two. In the next video, we'll talk about the next three murders that Andrew committed and what happened to him afterwards. Thank you guys so much for being here and watching. I hope you're enjoying this series. Let me know in the comments if you are. I will see you guys very soon. Stay kind and stay She's beautiful. She's like a sickness Bye. in my brain. A vision standing by the window pane. She ripples through the blinds and leaves me in a daze. It's in the way about a movie.